all right thanks everybody for uh for your attention um yeah so i just thought i'd maybe uh you know question uh, a paradigm um which is that uh yeah excel is evil um and it, it really should have no place uh in our research uh so this is the uh, as they call it the Feynman approach uh, a good way to uh collect your thoughts on something is to commit to giving a presentation on it um and so that's uh been enabled me to to do that uh, for for this talk so thank you for that um all right so just quickly then let's get some uh appetizers out of the way so that we can kind of get to the meat of today's uh, uh topic um so our excel problems uh pretty common and yes they are uh for example the british secret service uh, bugged a thousand wrong phone numbers uh, because they uh, did a formatting error and so they bugged all the phone numbers ending in 000 rather than the correct ones. Um, JP Morgan lost $6.5 billion because of a spreadsheet error uh, in what's known as a value at risk computation. Um, and this is known as the London Whale incident and it was all due to error prone and not easily scalable ways of doing calculations. And another nice little one is a Canadian power company called Transalta that bought shares uh, or, or sorry contracts at the wrong price uh, and lost uh, 24 million dollars all because of a copy and paste error uh, in in spreadsheets. Um, so the, these these kind of errors are pretty common. So today's goal is uh, to get you to think twice. Um, I, I don't expect that we're going to change the world overnight. Uh, so getting you to think twice is definitely the first step. Um, can we avoid defaulting to comfortable tools and, and instead select the best tool for the job? Um, you know, okay, I've titled it Excel. That really was a alliteration, uh, but it's all spreadsheet, right? So I include Google Sheets or anything uh, uh, LibreOffice in, in that space as well, Calc as well. So is Excel evil? Um, many of you may not think so, but let's consider a fairly typical research scenario, right? So about you know six months ago, you solved some pretty good problem for your research in Excel. Uh, you've got maybe three versions of the spreadsheet. You can't particularly remember what you did. You didn't take any notes. Uh, now you need to repeat the analysis. Uh, you've got some new data as well. And over the course of that six months, the theory has updated a little bit. Uh, and of course you want to publish this stuff. So now you need to format the plots into the journal style. Um, where do you go? You're, you're, you're stuck. Um, and this is a pretty common sort of situation for us. So um, is Excel evil? Yeah, because now you're in Excel hell. Uh, so let's have a think about what went wrong. Why is uh, what transpired there not particularly good scientific practice? Um, so to answer that, let's have a look at what sort of good scientific practice does look like and, and let's then see how spreadsheets fit into that space. So let's talk about good science. So good science is humble. It's reproducible. It's efficient to do. It's collaborative. Uh, it's verified. It's well documented. And of course, at the end of all that, it's peer reviewed. And we'll see that spreadsheets pretty much don't fit in in that paradigm at all and the figure on the right for me is is one of the great uh examples of what good science is and uh this is a photograph of the 1919 solar eclipse and um maybe we'll circle back at the end of the presentation and we'll see if uh if anybody knows why that photo is is representative of what good science looks like so let's dig in a little bit more on, on this idea of good science. So these hallmarks of good science mean that data is absolutely sacrosanct. It is, it is gold dust for us, right? So it is the one thing that we do not want to compromise. So data should be kept pure. And this means that there should be no edits to data by people or by code. And if there are to be edits, which there shouldn't be, but if there are to be, we should record those edits, uh, the who, what, why, when, that those edits were made. Data should be kept raw. So any sort of analysis or derived quantity should be completely separated from the raw data storage. So even if you have some measurements and you post-process 
to, to tidy because maybe you have some missing data points or it was a little bit noisy. Uh, this is a new data set. The original data should be kept uh, un, un, uh, polluted. And the last one is data should be stored safely. And this means that we should have sufficient capacity to store the data. The, do the data should be stored in the right format type. So this means if it's a string, it should be stored as a string. If it's a float, it should be stored as a float and so on. And of course it should be scalable because when we're storing data, we sometimes don't exactly know how much we're gonna get or somebody will wanna add new data. And so we uh, should be looking at a scalable solution for our data storage. So management of data is, is really key to good scientific enterprise. And uh, an author that, that I really respect, this guy, Richard McElreath, uh, he says that the stages of good data management are uh, organizing, curating, testing, and contributing. So organizing is getting it all set up uh, in the first place. Curating your data is keeping it going um, over time. Testing it is, is periodically dipping in and making sure that the data still works with the pipeline that you have. And contributing means that uh, as new data comes in, uh, it can be integrated into your existing data set. Uh, it also means that others can supply or use your data. So these kind of hallmarks of good data management and good scientific practice, I, I think you could begin to see that the use of spreadsheets doesn't particularly fit well with them. And computer science has been wrestling with these problems uh, really since, since it, it started because they have been uh, dealing with um, diverse and collaborative teams for a long time. So in computer science, you have things like uh, version control, uh, dispersed collaboration, something called continuous integration, which uh, we probably won't have time to get into today. Uh, documentation, of course, in computer science is very important. And unit testing, um, I'll try and touch on that in a, in a few minutes uh, if, if you're not sure what unit testing is. So these are the, the hallmarks of good science. And uh, how do they fit into a typical good scientific workflow? Well, um, a typical workflow is you will develop some hypothesis. Uh, you will express your theory uh, in, in some sort of code. Um, a really important point that many people miss and, and many published papers miss is confirming that your uh, inference can actually work in principle. So, so forgetting about, uh, you, you know, actually uh, looking at statistically significant results, but, but can it even work in principle? And then a, an important uh, part of the, in the step is to use your hypothesis uh, and generate fake data and see if you can detect uh, what your, the presence or, or, or non-presence of your hypothesis in this fake data. So this is known as the inferential pipeline. And uh, after you've done all that and confirmed all of this is working, uh, only now introduce real data into your, uh, into your workflow. And what, why this process, is, which is known as kind of generative modeling or generative thinking, why this process is so important is it, be, it avoids something called p-hacking, which is uh, what, where we go in search of the result that we want. Uh, and so this is known as the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. So it's a, it's a little story. If, if you haven't heard it, um, you, you know, this guy arrives to a, to a barn in Texas and, and uh, you know, there's, there's lots of uh, bullet holes in the side of the barn and there's a big circle drawn around the bullet holes. And, you know, the, the, the guy says, wow, you're an amazing shooter. And, and uh, the sharpshooter's uh, wife says, no, he's not. He just fires at the barn and then comes along afterwards and circles his shots. Right. So that we do this in science quite a lot. It's called p-hacking and, and it's, uh, you, you know, it's obviously not something good. And the workflow that we've outlined here is uh, is is a way of avoiding that problem. Uh, so spreadsheets don't really uh, work well with with generative modeling because, of course, they can't generate fake data typically. So maybe now we've got some ideas of what good science is out of the way and let's have a look at where spreadsheets really cause these pinch points in 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 good science right so um i mentioned that humility uh is one of the hallmarks of good science and um this means that even though you know we're all great and none of us make mistakes right it's mistakes are made by other people well uh we need to recognize our own fallibilities and, and we also need to recognize our cognitive biases and and we should know that um, sp our spreadsheets have mistakes in them, right? So uh, a study on uh, um, 
submitted auditing as so, so for financial auditing purposes right so these are legal requirements uh and the sell error right there is about one percent right and, and when you're talking about spreadsheets that have thousand or five thousand cells that's a significant percentage and so this leads to something called cascading failures where one cell with an error leads to two cells with an error leads to four cells with an error uh, and so it's estimated that about 90 percent of spreadsheets have errors and so uh, we, we need to be humble and recognize that, that that these errors happen. So how can we kind of, you know, guard against them? Uh, and this is uh, reproducibility and verifiability. Um, now, in terms of reproducibility, um, spreadsheet work is, is, is not particularly good at this. So in the Excel hell situation I outlined earlier, um, you're faced with manually uh, redoing the analysis that you had done six months previously, which you can't quite remember what you did. And this is all because it's a, it's, 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 it's a graphical user interface driven manual process. Everything is mixed in together. The, the data, which, which is mixed with its analysis, derived quantities and the reporting uh, is all mixed in together. Uh, and of course, there's lots of uh, complicating factors um, in Excel. And you know we'll, we'll touch on some of those in a few minutes. The nature survey that I've that I've linked to here uh, is particularly interesting because in physics and engineering, the survey showed that more than half of uh, physicists or engineers cannot reproduce their own work. Right. Forget about science being reproducible by other people. More than half can't even replicate their own work. That's pretty shocking. Right. So this is the reproducibility crisis in, in, in science. Uh, and, and there's a lot of thought around the fact that spreadsheets are actually hampering our progress. So I touched on verifiability earlier. Um, and, and part of the problem with, with why do spreadsheets have so many errors, it's because they're so difficult to audit or to verify. Um, and so, uh, so some of the, the things that are done in spreadsheets we know are terrible programming practice. So these are known as code smells. So, so writing very elaborate one-line formulas, uh, go-to statements, uh, which, which were all the rage in the 80s, you know, got pr pretty quickly uh, got rid of because it was realized it led to spaghetti code. But of course, spreadsheets are simply uh, an assemblage of go-to statements. Uh, the hidden logic, uh, the, the raw data is, is not is, is a first class citizen along with any other calculated number or entry. Everything is a first class citizen in spreadsheets. And as we've seen earlier, raw data should really be sacrosanct. The very little documentation that you can put. So the comments might be in a cell beside it or even worse in a note that's attached to a cell. Uh, and, it, and this is this is kind of not, not so great. So, so the documentation is a problem. Uh, spreadsheets are just horrendously error prone. Uh, because of a whole bunch of different things that can go wrong, uh, wrong data types, autocorrects. And we'll see some of these later on in some more case studies. Uh, and it's untestable unit tests. Unit tests are where you uh, develop a small little um, you know, function that maybe does two or three calculations and you test it uh, against uh, an answer that you know to be true. Uh, and then you um, test that unit of code and then you assemble more of these units of code into a, a package um, that does the job that you want. And, and spreadsheets are pretty much untestable because if you copy that formula out of that spreadsheet to test it, well, now it's not in that spreadsheet anymore. And just as an example of, of what auditing uh, is, is a problem, uh, I've got uh, one of my formulas here. Um, and uh, again, we can come back at the end and we'll see uh, if anybody knows what that formula is doing just by looking at it. Version control is is a really good thing in uh, computer science that we can learn from, and uh, I've certainly suffered a little bit from from this comic. You know, you get to the end, you say final, oh no, final revision two, final revision six, uh, and it just keeps going. Uh, and this uh, version control, of course, is is really unprofessional. Let's say um, it, it it suggests that there's no formal process. Uh, for versioning, uh, which isn't great. Now, Google Sheets is a little bit better because um, it does at least have version history. Uh, Excel doesn't, um, but it's still not great because uh, uh, these changes can be merged and, and then the history of those changes and is, it can be lost. So what do people do in Excel? Well, well, they do this, and, and this, is, this is one of mine from a few years ago, um, where you, know, you make a change to the spreadsheet, you just save it as a new number, right? Uh, the problem here is that you don't actually, you can't 
find what changed other than manually going through uh, those spreadsheets, right? So you got to open, you know, spreadsheet six and seven uh, and then manually look and go through. Uh, and of course, that that's just, you know, very laborious. It's inefficient and it's error prone. So it's not a good way. Um, sometimes people do even better. They decide to use their email inbox as their version history. Uh, and, and you know this 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 is a shocker um, because you know over time emails get lost and we don't know what changed and um, so version control and spreadsheets just don't go together so well. So I'll give you an, a, a look at what computer science has begun to adopt. Um, so this is just an example from uh, yesterday. I'm, I'm uh, trying to leverage these uh, tools. So this is um, from from GitHub and uh, there's a few really um, interesting things in, in this where um, I can uh, here I can see that, that this stuff here got deleted, uh, this stuff here got added. Um, I'm able to talk to the, the contributor and, and say what I think about the changes that have taken place. The contributor is replying to me saying, you know, yeah, I can understand or I'll change that later on. Uh, and all of this is 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 recorded um, in in the history of that document, uh, and it's timestamp, and the conversation is there. So when it comes to reproducing this work, it's very clear what has taken place. So it, it's a it's a it's a really professional workflow. I've touched on efficiency a little bit, um, and I touched on the fact that it's all GUI-driven manual work. And and you know, if you've had to change some figures or plots in Excel, you know it's a nightmare. New font sizes, styles, um, trying to size the figure so that the font appears as twelve in the document like it should. Uh, and you know, when 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 you've resized and copied and pasted the figure, you know, for the fourth time, you got to ask yourself, does this isn't right. There's something wrong with what I'm going about here, and it's the tool. I'm using the wrong tool for the job. Um, and of course, something uh, I've been particularly guilty of is is that I think, oh, this is just a quick one. I'll only I'll only do this analysis once and, and make this plot once. And of course, uh, the tenth time I come back to that plot, I kick myself and wish I had I just coded it up in the first place. I also mentioned scalability. Um, now, while uh, modern Excel has, uh, you know, two to the power of 20 rows, um, anything over about 50,000 rows in Excel grinds to a, to, to a crawl. You know, it's very slow to try and do any sort of uh, calculations with. And in, in this era of big data, this is, this is just not the right way of going about it. Um, so I'd encourage you, you, you know, definitely at day one, just, just think long term. Um, about what your workflow will be and the fact that um, you're likely to have to repeat every click um, you're, you're doing uh, if, you, if you're in a spreadsheet. You're better to code it up once, uh, test that piece of code, and then it's done forevermore. So this is known as the dry principle, which is do not, re do, do not repeat yourself, right? Don't repeat yourself, D-R-Y. Um, because if you do a job and you do it once and you do it well, that should be it. You should never have to do that job again. So what are the, some of the common errors that we see in spreadsheets? Um, and this is uh, inspired by, by Data Carpentry, which, which is, a, is a great resource. Um, using formatting to convey data is a, is a real pet peeve of mine. I get these lists of students and, and I'm told the students highlighted in red, um, you know, have special consideration. Well, if you're trying to give me data, Add a column and put a one against the students that have special consideration because now I can automate and pull uh, from that database. Using formatting to convey data is, is really bad practice. Um, multiple tables of data in one sheet mean that uh, your, any external program will, will pull that, that row as a single piece of data, which is flawed. Um, multiple sheets of data is, is getting a little bit better, but, but of course external programs have problems reading multiple sheets, um, so that isn't so good. Uh, merging cells kills uh, anything else like um, uh, or, or Python um, or any scripting that you're trying to pull, so don't do any of that. Um, some, some other problems are not properly distinguishing between zero and null values, like an observation of zero or no observation are not the same thing. Um, and and a, a killer is, is, is 
packing information into one cell. So adding a comment to a number or putting the unit for a number in that cell. Uh, the unit, you know, preferably all, all your numbers are in the same units, but if they're not, add a unit column, you know. So lots of uh, these kind of common errors cause problems in, in science. So on to a few of the uh, the case studies then um, that are, that are pretty well known. I think, um, or, or if yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully you don't know. Them. Um, so genome naming. Uh, it's reckoned that about twenty percent of all uh, uh, genomic um, journal papers have errors, uh, and this is because um, many genomes have names like March one, Sept one, and so on. Um, and what happens if you enter those names into a spreadsheet is Excel converts them uh, to a date. Uh, and of course, if you're dealing, uh, and these people are usually dealing with very large data sets, it's impossible to verify that there are no uh, conversions like that in there. Uh, so what has happened is uh, instead of changing Excel, the um, Human Genome Committee have changed science. Uh, the body responsible, they've renamed 27 genes uh, to avoid this problem of Excel autocorrecting, something that did not need to be autocorrected. The next one is is uh, really um, uh, impactful. Uh, so this is known as the Reinhardt Rogoff error. Uh, so you you'll you'll remember the GFC uh, in two thousand eight, uh, and after that, governments were really struggling to to figure out what they should do to try and help the world economy recover. Uh, two uh, leading Harvard economists, Reinhardt and Rogoff, uh, published a paper in which. Um, they, they said that uh, increasing government debt actually uh, hampered economic uh, uh, growth. Um, and a lot of people tried to replicate this work uh, and they couldn't. And this PhD student uh, in, econ in econometrics, uh, Thomas Herndon, he tried to replicate it. Uh, he contacted them, couldn't replicate the work, contacted them, tried to get the original uh, data and, and they did provide him the spreadsheet. Uh, and this is the spreadsheet that they gave uh, Thomas Herndon. Uh, and the uh, guilty cell is uh, highlighted there. And maybe you can see the error. The formula only goes down to row 44. So there are five cells missing uh, off that. Did this matter? Yes, it did. Because when you include those five cells, economic growth is now shown to be positive with increasing government debt above 90% GDP. As a consequence of this paper, and these are in parliamentary records, this paper was cited. As a consequence, both the EU and the US implemented austerity measures, right? So uh, Paul Krugman is, is a Nobel uh, winning um, economist. He called it the XL recession because on the basis of these five cells, many countries went into recession uh, because of austerity measures and they didn't have to. So that's a pretty impactful uh, spreadsheet error. The last one is more recent. This is in uh, October uh, this year. The UK government lost 16,000 positive COVID-19 test uh, cases. Um, and it was all because of uh, Excel. But what actually happened was that each positive case has about 50 rows of data. And as the daily number of cases exceeded about 1,300 people, this exceeded uh, 2 to the power of 16, which is 65,000. And this is the row capacity of uh, pre-2007 Excel, uh, .xls files. Uh, and what happened is all those additional cases were simply truncated off the data that was being shared. What are the results of this? Well, the lost COVID-19 cases were never contact traced. It's estimated that about 125,000 additional infections were not caught. And as a result of that, it's thought that about 1,500 people died due to this spreadsheet error. And so that is, uh, um, you know, it's really uh, significant, I think. So what are the takeaways then from what we've seen? So uh, Excel is evil, right? Um, feel guilty when you open it up. Feel guilty when you use it. And so the European Spreadsheet Risk Interest Group, um, <laughs> in, in, in a pretty cool thing, that, that they have uh, given us an Excel formula to tell us what to do. So if your use is critical, Use a formal software engineering process. If you're, or if your use is important, use a database. Otherwise, if it's not critical and it's not important, have some fun with spreadsheets. So for our research, if you think your research is important, that should say important, uh, don't use spreadsheets. 
Um, if you think your research is not important, go ahead, use spreadsheets. Uh, there are much better tools for the scientific workflow. I'd, I'd love to you know, spend more time to go into those, uh, but maybe that's another talk. Uh, and I encourage you all to approach data and c code professionally like computer science uh, does. Um, uh, and we can take a lot of inspiration from their work. So there's some further evidence in case you're not convinced of, of uh, you, you know what I've said. Um, so uh, go to that website, the European Spreadsheet Risk Interest Group, um, uh, and some other ones there. Uh, the video uh, Richard McElreath, uh, Science's Amateur Software Development, is, is really, really excellent viewing, and I've been uh, inspired by a lot of what he's written. Um, Talk Python to me as a few excellent episodes on escaping Excel hell. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you. So R Richard, uh, He's got this great quote where he says, Excel tolerates all kinds of error. In fact, it actively generates them. And so I think we've seen some of those cases uh, in this talk. So um, looking forward to, to a discussion, um, but please email me uh, your thoughts and uh, I'll reward anybody who, who gives me some uh, inspiring thoughts on, on this topic with, with a copy of the slides. Uh, so thank you.